Hey everybody, it's Seth, Paul, and Mo for Everything Money. We're back at you again today, talking about an interesting topic, Paul. Uh, we are big fans of Michael Burry, the movie The Big Short. We're usually fans of what he does, how he finds investments, finds anomalies in the market, and takes advantage of them. But this one's not really as hidden <laughs> as other uh, finds he's had in the past, Mo. This is right out in the open. Kathy Wood's ARK ETF, ARK K, uh, an explosively growing disruptive stock. Uh, ETF. ETF, the, a basket the, of stocks. The Innovation ETF. Say that again, Mo. The Innovation ETF. Exactly. And so he's right out. In quarter two, he wrote puts again. This, you know, some of the articles are a little misleading, Paul. They're calling that he's basically shorting this, which is not necessarily the case, right? So explain, explain your thought. There's a difference of shorting a, a particular stock and putting puts against it and buying buying puts against it yeah, so, so so give me some of your thoughts on this topic about michael berry making a bet against kathy wood and her well a while back we did, we did do a video on looking at kathy wood's arc investment and i think we sat there and looked at the top 20 holdings they had and 17 were losing money so of course kathy wood came out this morning and said i believe michael burry had a great insight in 2006, fundamentals, following the housing market. But here, he doesn't understand innovation. That's right. Okay, so if I'm Michael Burry, first off, he's not going to respond to that because... He's awesome. Yeah, he's a pretty... He's not like me. It's a pretty classy guy, right? So he's going mm -hmm. to sit there and ignore that. But what Michael Burry is sitting there saying is the same thing we're saying. Innovation is great. But if you overpay for innovation and growth, you're just overpaying. It doesn't matter. I mean, 2000 was built on the exact, I mean, the internet between 2000 and now, how different is the internet today? Yesterday we were talking, Tim and I do a, a treadmill session two times a week and we were talking about our, our, something we want to do for our software. And I said, oh, I really wish you could notify me. He looked at me and goes, yeah, Paul, we can have text sent to you the second the stock hits this, this, and this. And I'm like, I mean, guys, 20 years ago, it was amazing that you could even have email for free on the internet, right? So- when we sit there and talk about innovation, how much has the internet changed in the last 20 years? And then go back 20 years ago and tell me all the internet companies that are around today that were out there. And go look at the ones that are that did survive, the tech companies that did survive, the internet companies that did survive. Go look at how much they fell during the 2000 tech crash to then rebound today. But most of them went out of business. So all that Kathy Wood is trying to sit there and say is, what she's essentially saying is, you can pay whatever you want for innovation. As much as you might, as much as she might disagree with that, that statement, it's 100% true because she recently said, as much as she talks about innovation and fundamentals, yet why did she justify her Tesla investment by saying, hey, if it grows 92% a year, this is a value play. Well, if it's, not, if, it's, if it's about innovation, why do you care about fundamentals? Because that's what you're saying when you say it's about innovation. What I'm sitting there saying is, I don't care as much about innovation as much as I care. Actually, in fact, I don't care about innovation. What I care about, what Michael Burry probably says is, what we care about is how much are you paying for that growth. That's it. That's fundamental and it involves innovation because when you care about growth, you care about innovation, right? But you're sitting there saying, I don't care if you're going to cure cancer. I'm not going to pay you $100 trillion to cure cancer. Why? Because it's not worth $100 trillion, right? Curing cancer is not a $100 trillion business. I shouldn't say that for sure, but call it it's not a 50 quadrillion dollar business, okay, right? Okay. There's a certain value to cancer. Even if a, you could cure cancer, you can do a, 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 a discounted cash flow model and say, okay, how much would this save the world if we cured cancer? I would think that curing cancer would probably be the most innovative thing we could do right now. Yes, it would. Yeah. Right? Yes. So all we're sitting there saying is, unfortunately, is there's still a discounted method to valuing that. Kathy Wood's sitting there saying, nope, innovation's the best thing in the world. He doesn't understand innovation. He doesn't understand all this stuff. Michael Burry is saying what we say, which is, no, I understand that growth matters and innovative companies tend to grow. I'm just not willing to pay through the nose for it. I, I think what normal people also have to realize, Paul, and I bring this up on the show, if you're new, is you have to start separating your mind from the ticker price of Tesla versus the growth potential of Tesla. And they're not always one and the same, as we've shown multiple times with other companies who had a huge boom in 2000 and have still never got back to those levels. So just because Tesla is opening gigafactories all over the planet and they're going to have all these batteries and solar panels and chargers and they're going to have robo taxis doesn't mean their stock price is going to go up. In fact, it could go in half to a quarter. It's possible. Look at Intel, Look at Cisco. These are two major companies that survived the tech crash, grew three or four times their profit in 20 years, and their stock is still below where it was in 2000. 
Even the companies that did make it, like Microsoft, Apple, and, and Amazon, their stocks fell dramatically, upwards of eight, upwards of 95% for Amazon before it started its big run up. But even then, the stock is only up 20 times, even though the revenue is up 200 times. So it still didn't match that. Look so at, what were you going to say? Yeah, I mean, in the, in the short term, look at what Alibaba is doing right now. It's, when, when Seth just said company and stock are not the same thing. Alibaba is getting smoked. Our, our, our Patreon right now, I mean, our, um, our Discord right now is blowing up with everybody worrying about Alibaba dropping below $175. It, but if you look at their financials, they're doing great. Well, and the funny part is, uh, uh, Kathy Wood also exited Alibaba saying, yes. I'm worried about China. It's like, well, wait a second. Why worry about China? All of a sudden now that fundamental to you does matter. If it's a disruptive company, if it's growing like crazy, it doesn't matter. Why all of a sudden does something fundamental matter? Right. That's what I don't get about these, about these hype investors. They talk about hype and hype and hype. It's more important. Growth is important. But then all of a sudden some kink in the armor comes that's fundamental based and oh, wait a second, I'm out. It's like, they, wait they, a second. They use fundamentals when convenient to their argument. Yes, correct. What I'm doing, what Michael Burry does, what we're trying to teach here is innovation matters, growth matters. The question is how much you pay for that innovation, how much you pay for that growth. Right. I love my, I just came up with this analogy about cancer. Cure cancer tomorrow. Find me anything more innovative than that. And I'll tell you it's a 50 quadrillion dollar business. And if you look at me and say that's true, you are dumb. <laughs> that's just it. Is there a value to curing cancer? Absolutely. But, you to, but it's, it's not as easy as just saying, well, this is the cost. There's a bunch of healthcare costs that are saved. GDP goes up because people live around. But there's also costs involved. All of a sudden, more resources are taken because more people are alive. All these things have a cost assigned to it. All I'm sitting there saying is you can overpay for innovation. You can overpay. And that's what Michael Burry's saying. And what he's doing instead of straight shorting the stock, yeah. he's buying puts. Which means he's buying options at much lower prices. And he's hoping for a dramatic drop where even if the stock price doesn't hit his option prices, the volatility makes those options prices skyrocket. Because now, as it gets closer to his strike price, let's say the stock is currently, what is the ETF currently at? It's currently at 115, right? So at 115, let's say hypothetically, he sold options, he bought options at 50 for a year from now. In the next week, the stock goes from 115 to 75, even though it hasn't hit 50 yet, that volatility is gonna make that option price skyrocket in value. Just absolutely skyrocket in value. So it's a way to, in, to invest less money and have a downside risk that's capped. His only risk is the cost to buy that option. When you straight short, your risk is theoretically infinite. infinite because yeah. as the stock goes up and up and up, you're, st- you're, you're, you're losing money as you go up. With the options, when you're buying puts, you can only lose how much you pay for that option. And by the way, I have no idea. I don't think they disclosed. Did they disclose what the yeah. strike prices were? Uh, no, they didn't disclose st- strike prices. They just disclosed the value of the overall position. Well, and that's going to be based on not even well, his investment. Exactly. Of it. It's going to be on the whole total. Right. You know, right. so it, it's kind of. But it's they didn't a, disclose strikes. It's a great way to also kind of not hide, but he, we don't know what he paid for those puts. Right. But the bottom line is everything we teach on this on this channel you know, I was reading. I was reading uh, "Richer, Wiser, Happier." You've heard of that book? A couple times, yes. <laughs> okay, so I was reading it last night, and every almost every chapter says that every person like changed their thought process and they realized they're buying a business. Like so many value investors, the fundamental thing that they have is buy as much earnings and cash flow and growth as you can for as little as possible, and realize you're buying a business when you're buying a stock. Yep. This has been the big eye opener for so many people, and so many people also have a hard time understanding that concept, like. How am I buying a business when I'm just getting a, a piece of a company? It's like, well, it's no different than if you bought your neighbor's mechanic garage, 25% of it. What's the difference? The only difference is every day, Mr. Market tells you what they think the, the company is worth. And it's your decision to be a buyer, a seller, or hold. That's it. If you bought your neighbor's mechanic's garage and it kept growing, would you care what it was worth today, tomorrow, next day? No, what you care about is, hey, every year is revenue going up? Yes, is profit going up? Great. And what, what does that mean to the value of the company? It's probably going to go up as well. Mm-hmm. Overall. Now, they can do stupid things, but that's the whole idea behind value investing. Yeah, Mo. So in the end, I mean, we have a, a – Kathy Wood is a cheerleader of her fund. No matter what happens in the market, it's always good news to her. Always. So if it's going up, it's a buy. If it's down, it's a buy the dip. And so in the end, like – Until it goes down too much, like Alibaba, where I think she got spooked because it went down in half. And she's like, I'm out. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so Mo, what are your what are your thoughts on what Michael Burry found besides the obvious of a bunch of companies that don't make any money? You know, 
I don't know if it's more than what's obvious. I mean, we've discussed it multiple times here. Maybe it just is the obvious. I mean, he said back in back in June, I believe it was, he's, he put out a tweet and it was like supposed to be this cryptic tweet about how this is going to be the worst crash that you've ever seen. So uh, what maybe- was his exact tweet about that? Because we were talking about it yesterday and I said, and I said to you, I was like, listen, the pendulum swings, right? And for it to be this ridiculous on the high side, it's got to go even more ridiculous on the left. Now, what does that mean? I don't necessarily mean just a, like the quick crash of COVID didn't really teach many lessons because we went and doubled. We now officially have doubled since our crash in COVID. I look at it saying we've got to have a very long, drawn out, just down market and sideways for a long, where people just go, and we're going to have this, pardon me, we're going to have this issue with our, with our patrons. When they're looking at us going, our subscribers, our software, they're going to look at it and say, Paul, I bought this value stock. It's done nothing. It's like, I know. And eventually the market will take hold. Eventually the market will say, wait a second, this is the right, this is the wrong value. Let's start bidding it up. Yep. That's yeah. what happens. In his description of the markets, he says this is the greatest speculative bubble of all time in all things. And all hype speculation is doing is drawing in retail before the mother of all crashes. That and you know, Manesh Pabrai, that was his term. Yep. he disagrees with that. He thinks there's just pockets of bubble. I, I, maybe so, but I also look at this pocket of bubble and I say, hey, the same with 2000. In 2000, small caps and mid caps were not overpriced. There was a lot of value there. In this market, I see small caps and mid caps still getting overpriced a little bit. There's still prices, there's still stocks to be bought in all levels. Of course. And of course, more in small and mid, but it's just overall, we're looking at this market going, how do we even justify any of this? It's it's just, I think, I do think, it, I do agree with them that this is going to be a very, very bad one. So in light of this, what can you tell our new viewers, our followers and patrons around the world uh, in, in to wrap, what should we be doing in the next coming months? First, you should follow us on Instagram because we're trying to get our blue check mark. That's kind of our, uh, our goal. What do you, what button are you hitting? I was thinking about something funny, some sort of sound dropped. <laughs> <laughs> so follow us on Instagram because I want to have that blue check mark so badly. <laughs> if I don't get it by the end of the year, I might cry. But two... Guys, if this makes sense to you, this is what's important. I always tell people, I don't care what process you choose as long as you pick a process that makes sense to you. Whether it's charts, whether it's momentum trading, whether it's value investing, whatever you choose, it's got to be process driven. If this process makes sense to you, just subscribe, watch more videos, read a ton. In In our software subscribers, our patrons, I started talking about having a book club. Because I want to start having us read one or two chapters of these books that I keep talking about yeah. every single week and discussing it on patron-only live streams, right? Because I think this is very important. It's about being around people that have like-minded thoughts. But the funny thing is, we have 5,100 people in our Discord that are talking. But guess what? There's People disagree with me all the time. All the time. Paul, you're wrong on crypto. Great. More power to you. It's all about these ideas coming together. So just keep learning. Paul, you mentioned, make- I hate to interrupt, but you mentioned process. I'm- have you ever met met any normo any normal person who has a process besides I should buy a stock and hope it goes up? Great I've question. Never and I will tell you this: meant anyone the, a, the way a you normal become, person? Go ahead. The way you become an above normal investor is by doing that. If you want to be normal, do the normal thing, which is have no process, yeah. and that'll that'll guarantee you normal results. And 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 you know it's funny. Um, I call you called me yesterday. You FaceTimed me, and we were talking about richer, wiser, happier. And I said to you yesterday, I was like, "This is like I am falling in love with value investing more than I already was before because now I'm reading the book and I'm seeing that it's multiple people. It's not lone, like it felt lonely. Lonely, it yeah. felt like. But now it's it's like not lonely. They're all the same. They well, imagine if the you were in the way. imagine if you were growing up in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and you're a value investor. You didn't have YouTube. You yeah. didn't have all these people to talk. You're to. real lonely. Talk about lonely, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. But it, it's if you want to be a normal investor, do what everybody else does. That'll make you a normal investor. You won't beat the market. You'll trail the market. You'll think after 40 years that you made a ton of money when you only made 5 or 6% because the money, even at 5 or 6%, grows multiple times. If you want to make even reasonable returns matching the market, it's all about discipline. It's all about process. You have to buy into that process, though. And you have to buy in. You have to be disciplined. That's the hardest part of investing. And a big part of that is during this time, because it's going to get much worse than it is now, you need to be able to control your emotions. Absolutely. Whatever you have to do to work on that, do it. Because Joyce, in our, she's in the, in the, in the uh, Pulse Super Shorts. They're distracting me right now. She was like, I can't, it's hard for me to buy when a stock is going down. And I said, it's all just emotion. Just, you have to do something to learn to control your emotions. Because if you're going to be a value investor, you better learn a dollar cost average in without having a heart attack every time you click that and, button. And you better believe though, by the way, if a value bubble went from 175 to 125 tomorrow, I'd be like, 
wait a second. What What's I, going on? What did I get wrong? What are we missing? Yeah, exactly. I would absolutely do that. I fall by the same thing. Yes. But to me, funny thing is, the slow and steady go down doesn't bother me as much as the no. uh, on an individual company that I made a bet on. So I have the same emotional things. It's just yep. mine might be at a higher level. I think Gary, he's at a different level completely. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just that's the way to look at it. Yep. That's our take on Michael Burry and uh, Arc ETF. Um, let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Join the Patreon to get access to our software. We're giving away a Tesla in a couple months to one of our patrons. It should be phenomenal. And uh, stay tuned. If this was new to you, um, we're glad you watched. And uh, keep watching our videos and you'll learn a lot. Thanks so much. Fondle that thumbs up. You know I love it. I love you, those patrons. See you guys.